Did you know that your body uses ke chemicals every day? In fact, I guarantee you that your body's in the process of breaking down some chemicals as we speak. So how does this happen? Because we know chemical reactions aren't always reliable. Sometimes they can take thousands of years for two chemicals to meet up and react with each other. And sometimes they require extreme conditions, like really high temperatures or a certain pH. We know that our body can't always exist at certain pHs, and it definitely can't exist at very high temperatures. And we definitely can't wait around for thousands of years for a reaction to happen. So how does our body use these chemical reactions? That's where our biological catalysts come in, enzymes. Um, enzymes work to lower the energy of activation in a reaction to make sure that a reaction occurs when it's needed. If you're confused about what the energy of activation is or how a catalyst works, make sure you check out our chem video. So what exactly is an enzyme? Give me one second. Get a pen ready. An enzyme is a protein that consists of an active site, which is this area here, and an allosteric site, which is this area here. The active site and the allosteric sites are areas where different things can bind to the protein. Um, we'll talk about the active site now, and we'll mention the allosteric site again a little bit later. So why is it important that an enzyme is a protein? This means that the enzyme is made up of a string of amino acids. There could be thousands of amino acids in a string that makes up a protein. But what exactly is an amino acid? Well, it is an organic compound that's made up of an amine group which is our NH2 over here, a carboxyl group, which is our COOH on this side, and most importantly, it has an R group. There's 20 naturally occurring amino acids in the world, and each amino acid has a distinct R group or string of atoms that make it so that it can bind and react with only certain things. So let's look at an, enzy an enzyme on a slightly more molecular level than we just saw. If each of these circles represents a different amino acid, this region has a distinct R group, this region has distinct R groups, this one and this one, which means that whatever is going to bind to this active site must be able to meet the requirements of each of these R groups. It's a little confusing, so let's use an analogy. An analogy. Imagine you're having a dinner party with some of your best friends, right? And each of your best friends has a special preference about what they like to eat. One might be a vegetarian, one might not like spicy foods, but you want your dinner party to be a success. So you're going to find one meal that you can make for everybody, that everybody will like. Now, this is kind of like what an enzyme needs to do for its active site. Within the active site, there's a string of R groups that are around it. And in order to meet the requirements of each R group, the enzyme has to find something that all of them like, that all of them can react with. It's kind of how an enzyme can select for one specific thing that it binds to. So, how do enzymes work exactly? Well, there's other things, other proteins and molecules floating around the cell that we call substrates. They could be other proteins, they could be other molecules, but they're what the enzyme's going to react with. In this case, our little circle Pac-Man over here is going to be our enzyme. And along this active site is where the R groups would be. And the R groups want to find something that they can all react with. So there's one substrate out there that meets all of these R groups' requirements. In this case, it's our yellow triangle, which binds to the enzyme and makes an enzyme substrate complex. That's this entire thing here, the enzyme and the substrate bound together. We know that the enzyme is supposed to lower the energy of activation for the substrate to either break up or two substrates to come together for the reaction to occur. But how exactly does this work? Well, after the enzyme substrate complex forms, we undergo what we like to call a conformational change. Conformational change is just a big way of saying a, shape, a change in shape. So here we have our circle enzyme changed to a square enzyme. But what's the important thing about this change of shape? I'll give you guys a second to think about it. Why do you think it changes? Well, there's, a there's many different reasons why it changes, but the most important is that it's changing the tension that it's giving to the substrate. So when it was a circle shape and the substrate, our yellow triangle substrate bound to it, it fit perfectly. But it underwent a, cha a change of shape, which is actually pulling on the substrate. It's pulling the substrate in different directions because it's not the proper shape for the substrate to fit into necessarily anymore. And this tension 
can actually break the substrate in half. So it changes the substrate reactants into two different products. It lowered the energy of activation required to break it into two products, and it made it happen when the cell needed, needed it to happen. So that's what the cool thing about enzymes is. It allows a reaction to happen as soon as the cell or the body needs it to happen. Now, how do we stop reactions from happening? Or what would be the reason why enzymes need to stop happening? Give you guys a second to think about that. All right, so sometimes we need to stop reactions in the body from happening. And one of those reasons could be that we only have a certain amount of substrate, of the proper fitting substrate, and we don't want to use it all up at once. Or there's too much product. Products could be overabundant within the cell. So we need to turn off enzymes. And one of these ways, both the way that we turn off enzymes is called inhibition, which is stopping the process of an enzyme's reaction. One way that inhibition can happen is called active site inhibition. So we know that this is the active site of our, of our enzyme. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And in active site inhibition, we can have a, an inhibitor bind to it. Now I know I said that only substrates can bind to the active site, but think of it this way. A substrate and an active site are like a puzzle piece. There's only two that fit together perfectly, but you can force two puzzle pieces together and the pictures don't match up. That's kind of what this is, what's happening here. Our enzyme is binding with an inhibitor, and there's no reaction happening, but there's, it's, binding, it's binding to the active site. But what does this binding to the active site do? It prevents the substrate that would normally bind to the active site from entering. It stops the reaction that the enzyme would normally do from happening. Remember when I mentioned allosteric sites earlier? Allosteric sites are these little things over here these little binding sites, and how do, oh, sorry about that, how do these allosteric sites work? Well, this is called allosteric inhibition or indirect inhibition. There's little molecules, um, proteins or other molecules that can bind to the allosteric site. There's no reaction that occurs there, but they can bind there, and what happens is the enzyme then undergoes another conformational chain, usually blocking the active site. So here we can see an enzyme coming in, and or a inhibitor coming in, binding to the allosteric site, and blocking the active site over here. So what does this mean? The active site isn't open for the normal substrate to bind to. It's preventing the normal reaction from happening. Another way that our cell can control when chemical reactions happen within our body. Now if I asked you guys to think of one place that you've heard of enzymes being used before, I'm sure I know exactly what you would say in your stomach, breaking up your food that you eat every day, but enzymes are used in so many more ways than that, and without them, we wouldn't be able to survive. Our bodies depend on chemicals and the way that chemicals are used, and it's enzymes that break them up and make the reactions happen the way we need them to happen. So I hope that this gives you a better understanding of how chemicals work within our body and how they're so how our bodies are a controlled organism as opposed to something that happens on its own randomly in nature, how being controlled is what leads to life. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact both of us. Make sure that you watch the video underneath. It's a biological reaction with the yeast enzyme that will show a reaction of how catalysts and enzymes are kind of the same thing and how it functions in the environment. It's a pretty cool experiment. Um, if you have any questions, make sure to contact us. Hope this helped. Bye.